For this episode of Biblical Genetics, I came to Sweetwater Creek State Park, one of my favorite locations, about half an hour from my house. It's beautiful here. There's lots of hiking trails. There's some really cool Civil War ruins right over here. In fact, if you've seen any of the Hunger Games movies, uh, one scene with Jennifer Lawrence was filmed right there. Now, it's funny because I'm not allowed inside the gate, but they filmed inside the fenced off area. And if that's there because it's dangerous, did J-Law know that she was risking her life to film her movie? One wonders. Now, I didn't come here to talk about movie making or sci-fi or even nature, even though I did find this cool black walnut on the trail just a little ways up there. And the trees are beautiful and some rare plants here and some really cool nature. And the river is high because we just had a hurricane. Even though I'm hundreds of miles from the coast, we don't get much wind, but it sure did rain a lot the last couple of days. And so the river is really high. I want to talk about something above genetics. Yes, it's called epigenetics. Epi is a Greek word for upon or above. And something in epigenetics is something beyond the genome. These are things in the cell that affect the DNA, that affect the way the DNA is expressed, what genes are turned on, what genes are turned off. And it is a major problem for Darwinian evolution because the more complex epigenetics becomes, the less able natural selection is to find and eliminate traits in a population. We thought that you got DNA, the DNA contained the gene, the gene did something in the cell, it gave you brown eyes, made you light skinned or dark skinned or shorter, tall or fat or skinny, or you know, all the traits that make up all the different cool people in the world are dictated by their DNA, we thought. But the genes that are in the DNA can be turned on or turned off based on the environment. Your cell will literally tag genes with carbons, with uh, methyls. That's a carbon with three hydrogens sticking off and the fourth bond of the carbon sticks onto the DNA. And when the gene is methylated, the polymerase as it's zipping down the gene gets stuck and it can't make copies of that piece of DNA. Your cell literally turns off the gene or turns on the gene if it needs to express it. Now think about it. You don't need all your genes every day. You need some genes during development. You need some genes during puberty. You need some genes at when you're stressed or really hungry or whatever. So your body can literally toggle genes on and off by either methylating the DNA or changing the proteins that the DNA wraps around the nucleus. Now that protein is called the histone and histone acetylation is a primary means of genetic regulation in your body. The question is, can these changes be inherited? Because if they're inherited, then all of a sudden we're talking about the inheritance of acquired characteristics. That's called Lamarckian evolution. That's something that was discredited 200 years ago, except Charles Darwin believed it to his dying day. He had this idea called pangenesis. He believed that as you're exercising or thinking or, or using your eyeballs, that the different organs in your body would butt off little corpuscles that would float to the gonads and they would absorb those corpuscles and be passed on to the next generation. And he talked about this. He talked about how sailors are usually farsighted and because sightedness is easily inherited, obviously those sailors who are exercising their eyes, looking far away at, at ships and the horizon and things like that, they would have farsighted babies. But jewelers are usually nearsighted. And he figured that, well, since they're squinting so much, looking at their watches and their jewels and their jewelry and stuff like that, and their eyes are getting so used to focusing up close, Obviously, since sightedness is highly heritable, it must be passed on to the children. So there is no inheritance of acquired characteristics. And yet epigenetics might be that. But it's a little more complicated than that because you have genes that were turned on or turned off in your mother. And if your mother was exposed to some environmental stress, you know, starvation or a poison, or if she's very sick, then your genes while you were developing as a baby would turn on and turn off in order to respond to that environment. And it might be affecting you today, but it's even more than that because when a woman is pregnant with a girl, after only 22 cell divisions from fertilization, that girl's ovaries are finished and the egg cells are in place. And yeah, people are arguing now whether or not there are stem cells that can produce more eggs, but it doesn't matter. Essentially, the eggs are in place after only 22 cell divisions. So you have grandma, mom, and baby. And if that mom, maybe she's 40 years old and she ovulates and has a child, that child could be born 40 years after grandma is pregnant and the child's DNA might be affected by something that happened to grandma because mom was inside grandma 
and half of the baby was inside grandma too. So epigenetics can be intergenerational, either through inheritance or through simply the fact that three generations can be present at the same time. And now we're talking about some factor in a child that might be expressed or not. And maybe natural selection says, I'm going to kill that child or not based on some expressed gene. But the effect was decades in the past. Natural selection can't work with that. Evolution can't work with that. The signal for selection must be clean. It must be seeable. It must be yes or no. Or Darwin's idea of natural selection completely falls apart. And that is what epigenetics does to Darwinian evolution. Hence the article I wrote about nine years ago, Darwin's Lamarckism vindicated with a question mark. And I started talking about epigenetics, but it's getting worse now, much worse, because now we know that sperm cells in the epididymis, they can absorb RNA. And there are papers with titles that use phrases like epigenetic inheritance. Wait a minute. If sperm cells absorb RNA that are coming from the body cells, that means the Weissman barrier has been broken. Now, what's the Weissman barrier? Uh, uh, Weissman was a German scientist back in the 1800s and late contemporary of Charles Darwin. And he figured out that there are two different cell types in complex organisms. There are somatic body cells and there are germline reproductive cells. And he said there is a barrier. We call it the Weissman barrier. We now know today that germline cells, that's sperm and eggs, are partitioned from the rest of the body and they are passed on your eyeballs, your hair, your fingernail cells. Those things are not passed on, only eggs and sperm, that DNA. And it's held separate in a special place and protected from the rest of the environment on purpose. But if cells are absorbing RNA from the somatic body cells, that's epigenetic inheritance. That means that we might be a product of our environment, not just our DNA. A brand new paper just came out this week. They looked at over 23,000 humans and they looked at epigenetic modifications in those people. And what they discovered was that all people carry rare epigenetic variants that affect your genes. They turn genes on, turn genes off. Some people have the BRCA1. Some people say BRCA or BRCA. That's the breast cancer gene. Some people have a hypermethylated version of that. There are other genes that affect B12 or folate metabolism, neurodevelopmental genes. You can have a neurodevelopmental anomaly. Your nervous system can be messed up, not based on your DNA, but based on epigenetics that you might have inherited from your environment. And what's happening now is we're realizing there's not just genetic entropy, there's also epigenetic entropy. We are literally losing control of the control systems that control our DNA. And it gets worse with age and it gets worse over time in populations because these factors can be inherited from one generation to the next. This is just one more complexity in the genome that makes evolution according to natural selection that much more difficult to believe. If you want more information, dig into the show notes, dig into the links that I've got going back to creation.com. There's a lot of information here. If you're wondering about evolution for maybe the first time, if it's true or not, mathematically, it has massive problems and I'm happy to report that. But practically it has massive problems also because natural selection can't work as advertised. And thank you to all my supporters who have made this show possible. Your generous contributions to the Buy Me A Coffee app has bought me many digital coffees and you're funding this project so other people can get some of this amazing information as well.